Assalamu alaikum and good morning everyone. Welcome to the session 2 about dental composites. As uh, we have discussed in detail about its composition, its chemical and physical aspects, classification, types and curing method. Today's lecture is mostly about polymerization shrinkage stresses and other tooth colored restorative materials. I cannot emphasize anymore that I have to make it as a separate lecture to give you a thorough understanding of this phenomenon. So let's begin with the fact that uh, we have tried our best to overcome various flaws in composite materials such as uh, we invented newer monomers with higher viscosity uh, with variable molecular weight and we also improved uh, the filler loading and the type of the fillers in any given system. So the composites of today are not like the compo composites which were available in the past. Uh, we have even better materials in terms of strength uh, longevity and most importantly the aesthetics. After all these endeavors one problem although not like in the past but still persists and this is the shrinkage stresses uh, in the composite during polymerization uh, in, uh, during the curing phase. Uh, which is apparently inherent for some reasons if we think about from metric system and the filler load but the shrinkage happens as the phase changes from a viscous liquid or a paste form to a complete solid state material and during this phase change there is an overall volume change of the set material and because during curing the molecules were making a covalent bond as they were coming together to some degree leading to some shrinkage and generating stresses within which can impede their long-term clinical success. So what is so bad about this polymerization shrinkage? If composites are not placed as recommended they end up with a variety of post restoration problems as they include marginal staining, micro leakage, secondary caries, enamel cracks, post-op sensitivity, internal gaps. Why? Uh, because of the failure of interfacial bonding as a result of shrinkage in material uh, which pulls itself from the bonded wall leading to a complete or partial bond failure at uh, dentine restorative interface. Post-op sensitivity um, as a result of the bonding leading to open the pathways towards the dentinal tubules and increasing the fluid movement and causing the post-op sensitivity. Recurrent caries, of course, if the gap is not visible to us but it is virtually there as a playground for bacteria because they are so small and can reproduce in that environment and in these gaps and will lead to the secondary caries the fracture of restoration and the tooth if the resistance form is not kept in mind during and the preparation may lead to deflection of the cusps or in more weakened state um, they can fracture. Although we were able to address the major problem of the composite shrinkage of factors which affect the polymerization shrinkage include uh, depending on the molecular structure of the monomer such as BIS-GMA or UDMA shrink less in comparison to uh, TAG-DMA. Other factors include the amount or the type of the filler. Uh, uh, <coughs> greater the filler, 
uh, lesser the shrinkage and vice versa. The rate of cure is another important factor to overcome the stresses uh, generated uh, within the cured material. Uh, fast setting materials generate uh, stresses more than slow set materials. Uh, self cure materials have slow setting, so there is time for molecules to arrange themselves according uh, to the flow. Light cure materials should be cured off by soft start or the pulse mode curing method. Bonding substrate is another important factor. Composites tend to debond from dentine if the strength is less than uh, 13 or 17 megapascal or less. Uh, strength is highest in enamel and we discussed that why. So most of the stresses are generated at the dentine restoration interface. The elastic modulus of the material or the flexibility the flowability of the resin composite is uh, another factor. Uh, flowables have a greater tendency to shrink. The C factor or the configuration factor is the stresses which generate because of uh, uh, cavity shape or its geometry. Uh, we'll see this in detail. So all of these factors are responsible for polymerization shrinkage. Uh, considering all the factors which affect the polymerization shrinkage, we saw in last slide, uh, let's assume that there is shrinkage going on. Uh, how to comprehend this phenomena? After proper application of composite, let's say well adapted to the walls, uh, which are already treated with any adhesive system of any generation, let's say fifth or seventh generation. Now what happens upon curing irrespective of the curing method? Is it a light cure or is it a self cure? Uh, let's see how it happens in, in this animation. Uh, during the polymerization process the volume of monomer is reduced due to uh, the reduction in intermolecular distance as they chemically attract and during bonding procedure as they are forming the covalent bond <clears throat> or the phase is changing from the liquid or paste form to almost a solid mass. So the volumetric polymerization shrinkage, uh, the modern composites uh, shrink during polymerization resulting in a volumetric reduction ranging from 1.5 to 5 percent means that the whole bulk of the composite is shrinking simultaneously and this whole bulk is exerting too much stress on the bonded walls although this can be reduced by using smaller increments of composites we shall discuss this in detail in the following slides but uh, this creates sufficient stresses at the dentine restoration interface to debond the material from the dentine, leading to a complete or partial bond failure at the dentine interface, thereby in decreasing the retention and increasing the leakage by forming the gaps. Uh, cavity geometry has a great impact on the polymerization shrinkage and we can describe that by calculating uh, the ratio of bonded to unbonded walls or by the way uh, this ratio of bonded to unbonded wall is C factor so let's discuss that now <coughs> the cavity configuration or the C factor was introduced by professor Carol Davidson in 1980s. So the C factor or the configuration factor is basically uh, the ratio between bonded to unbonded walls. The higher the value of C factor, the greater is the polymerization shrinkage. And this C factor makes us anticipate uh, about how much shrinkage could occur in any given tooth preparation geometry such as is it a class 1 or is it a class 4 
a greater the number of bonded walls, greater will be the C factor and there is greater chance of polymerization shrinkage stresses which could harm in a number of ways. We already see that. So the C factor, let's see in this model, we have only one bonded surface and four unbonded surface and we, if we divide one by four, we get a ratio of 0.25. Uh, about in this situation, we have two bonded surfaces and four unbonded surfaces. So what is the C factor here? It's uh, 0.5. Uh, as we are moving forward, the C factor, as in this situation, is gradually increasing. As you can see, the bonded surfaces are 3 and unbonded surfaces are also 3. So we get a C factor of 1. Uh, the bonded surfaces, for example, in this situation, there are 4 and unbonded surfaces are 2. So we are getting a C factor of 2. Remember that uh, if the C factor is greater than 1, there is a lot of stress which is being generated at dentine restorative interface during shrinkage. So <clears throat> what is the configuration factor, the C factor of class 1? Uh, we have five bonded and one unbonded surface. So if we divide five by one, we get a five. This is a C factor. Um, if it is greater than one, this is uh, too much. This C factor is five. If the C factor is greater than one, there is a higher chance of bond disruption. So what about class four? is the C factor in class 4. We have one bonded and four unbonded. So we have the least uh, C factor number here, 0.25. And what is the configuration factor of this cavity? This is a huge cavity. Can you tell me that? Take your time. I'm waiting. Okay, so there are two bonded walls and three unbonded walls. We are getting a C factor of 0.66. It is less than one. So I'm giving you an assignment, final year and third year. Uh, what could be the C factor of the class two? Uh, send in the WhatsApp group. All of you just submit your answers. So how to minimize C factor? Uh, more unbonded surfaces, more flow of the composite, less shrinkage. Composites placed in no more than 1 to 2 millimeters in increment. Uh, stress breaking liners like flowable composites can be placed to avoid shrinkage stresses. Uh, soft start polymerization instead of a high intensity light curing method or rapid curing method. <coughs> Uh, note that uh, the zinc oxide eugenol must not be used uh, under the composites because the eugenol has uh, the effect on inhibiting the actions on some of the composite constituents. So that's why it uh, interferes with the polymerization. So never use zinc oxide eugenol as a base or liner underneath any composite system. So uh, one way to overcome is by incrementally placing the small increments uh, and then curing. We call that the oblique uh, increment placement. And at each increment, we cure uh, the composite. So how much shrinkage can you anticipate have been generated in this situation? You can see that how much stress or the C factor in individual increment can be calculated and can be minimized by just uh, uh, changing the method of placement of composite. Uh, the normal curing mode in most light systems is uh, set to normal in which the light strikes at full intensity which is usually 500 
milliwatts per centimeter squares for 40 seconds on an increment of 2 millimeters. Uh, higher power lights are also available such as 1500 milliwatts per centimeter square which can rapidly cure the composite but can generate a lot of shrinkage stresses within the material. And to overcome this, we have two modes available to reduce the uh, polymerization related shrinkage stresses. Uh, one is the ramp up or soft start curing mode, where the intensity of the light is uh, gradually increased over three to four seconds, which minimizes the internal shrinkage stresses. Uh, the other mode which is suggested is the pulse mode uh, which has also an effect on minimizing the shrinkage stresses. So going to indications and contraindications of dental composites, uh, Dr. Zuhair is going to explain you in detail. In the era of modern dentistry, composite is a gold standard material and in every clinical situation we use the composites and uh, no one prefer amalgam in his white teeth so uh, the composite uh, is the gold standard nowadays what are the indications of the composite let's discuss about the indications class 1 the posterior surface of the molars class 2 the proximal surfaces of posterior teeth class 3 the proximal surfaces of anteriors and class 4 the proximal surfaces and the incisor surfaces of anteriors and class 5, it's about the cervical area of the posteriors and the interiors. And class 6, the cusp strips of the interiors and the posterior teeth. Uh, guys, why uh, composite uh, is a material of choice in all these cases? Because in amalgam, you need, you need a proper depth in the form of the cavity. You have to create a proper, uh, proper shape of the cavity. But in composite, you don't need all these steps. You just have to remove the caries. You have to fill your molars and the interiors with the composite and just cure it so you don't need an aggressive preparations in core buildups after doing the root canal therapy you have to build up your cavity and as you know that during root canal therapy you remove a lot of tooth structure to get access to your bulb chamber so in all these cases amalgam is not the material of choice because amalgam just wedge the tooth and can fracture uh, after root canal therapy so the best post and core material is basically uh, the composite because not only it reinforce the weak walls but also bond to the two structures so guys it's a preferred material as compared to amalgam after doing root canal therapy so guys pit and fissure sealants is a preventive therapy and uh, it's a preferred method as the young patient just visited you and they have uh, deep pits and fissures so we can use composite to just make these deep pits and fissures into the shallow one so that patient can clean them very easily so guys the composite is a material of choice uh, in preventive uh, restorations as well and you know a lot of patients just visited you and they say sir i have the problems in the shape of the interiors so sometimes you need to modify them and uh, you cannot put the amalgam uh, in the front teeth and ask the patient to smile with a black filling in the white teeth. So the best thing in all these cases is, is a composite because it's not only white in color, it's also a very conservative preparation. So you can modify the shape in a single visit. So a uh, lot of shades available in the market. So you, you can use them in your clinical practice. So partial veneers and uh, sometimes there's discoloration in the anterior teeth and might be brown spots or the white spots and uh, if you want to uh, modify the color of the teeth and make the discolored tooth into a single color you can use the composite here so in tooth color modifications composite is also the material of choice and uh, sometime patient visiting you and have and complaining that they have some spacing in the interior teeth and you can you have two options you can go to the orthodontic treatment or you next you have uh, close the spaces with your uh, white color restorative materials so uh, in diastema closures so composite is also a modern choice uh, in all these cases where the patient has some gappy smile or they have some spacing in the anterior teeth and you know the modern crowns they are based on the bonding uh, materials so sometimes you need crowns to bond to the tooth surface like zirconia and there is something emax crown so 
the resin cements are available in the markets that help in, in, in cementation of all these crowns and because the conventional uh, glass ionomer cements are not preferred uh, materials in, in, in bonding all these uh, crowns. And sometime uh, after doing the root canal therapy and you don't have a sufficient time, you some patients are waiting outside your office. So the composites like the flowable composites, you can just put in the in a tooth and cure it and uh, that 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 thing can be finished in 10 minutes so it can be used as a temporary restoration as well and periodontal splinting means sometime patients they have some episodes of the trauma and the teeth have some mobility so to fix the teeth uh, you can take orthodontic wire and just cement it on the tooth surfaces and uh, use a composite to bond the wire to the tooth surface so we call it the periodontal splinting as well and there is no absolute contraindication of dental composite. So in every situation, we can use composite. Uh, like the thing is mentioned, if isolation is not possible, I don't believe in that concept because isolation is in the hand of the dentist. And um, a lot of the students just complain to us, uh, patient is not, uh, uh, patient is complaining about the rubber dam. No, it's not like that because you don't have an idea how to play a dam. So isolation is not a problem. So it's not a contraindication even. In case of heavy occlusion, yes, the patient's grinding his teeth uh, and has a lot of uh, wear on the crucial surfaces. Sometime composite just wear off. So you can say that it, it might be a contraindication, but the modern composites are very good in all these situations. So the next thing is the habit of grinding. You know, I talked about that thing, the wear of the wear of the teeth. And composite you can use in all these cases, but you have to be very careful about the occlusions. So in all cases, first of all, we just improve the occlusions, then we do the composites. It's not like that patient is coming to you and just put the composite and cure. It's not like that. Then operator factors, obviously, if I have no idea how to do a composite restoration, so it's a contraindication for me. But if you know how to do it, then it's not a contraindication. So guys, there's no absolute contraindications. Every situation composite is a material of choice. Then comes towards the advantages. I think there is a lot of advantages. There is no disadvantage of the composite. So the first thing uh, you have to understand that the benefits of the composites everywhere. Like you have uh, improved the color of the teeth. It's a benefit of the composite. Conservative restoration is a very is a very important thing because in amalgam you see you have to prepare a lot of the law. You have to remove a lot of the tooth structures to just adapt the amalgam to the tooth. So a um, composite is a conservative restorations in all these cases. And then, you know, amalgam is a thermal conductor because when the patient bites some hot and cold uh, fluids and uh, you take some fluids hot and cold, so the heat transfer to the pulp. But in composite, uh, composite acts as insulating material. So you, you, you can say that patient, he can take any hot and cold fluids. There will nothing be happen with the composites. So, uh, then it's used almost universally. It means that uh, it, it, it's the most common material that find in the clinics. So you might not find amalgam in the clinics, but you will find composite in every clinic. And with the progression, with the period of time, the composite is getting improved day by day. So hopefully in the future, we'll get a lot of more composites. So bond to structure, that's a very interesting thing as amalgam doesn't bond to the tooth structure. So the composite basically it bonds, it reinforces the tooth structure and uh, it doesn't hurt the tooth, it doesn't fracture the tooth. And it's repairable obviously if the part of the composite is broken, you can repair that part with a new composite. You don't need have to remove all of the restorations and build it with a new composite. No, you can just remove the damaged part and you do the composite again. That's simple and amazing product basically. So uh, then come towards the disadvantages. Yeah, I don't think so. The polymerization shrinkage is also a disadvantage because it's all based on your technique. If you follow a right technique, there is no shrinkage. And obviously you know that we have discussed in the previous lectures that the low shrinkage composites are in the markets. And if you follow the protocol that if you do the composite in two millimeter increments and cure it properly, so there is no polymerization. So disadvan this disadvantage is not I think ideal in front of me so I don't believe in that so uh, yes it's a difficult job it's time consuming job it's costly yes it's not difficult if you if you have a good hands in composite you can finish a restoration 10 minutes 20 minutes 
and yes it's a costly because you can charge a lot when you do a composite restoration so uh, technique sensitivity yes you have a proper isolations you have to apply a proper rubber dam you cannot do a composite without rubber dam that's that's one important thing for all of you so you have to be very good in rubber dam isolation before taking a composite in your clinic greater occlusal wear yes you can say it it wear off easily so the clinic what is the clinical procedure of dental composites as you know that uh, there is an initial clinical procedure and the final clinical procedures the initially the first thing is you have to apply a local anesthesia that's a very interesting thing because local anesthesia not only reduces the flow of the saliva but also make a patient painless you can easily make a cavity if the patient is anesthetized so next thing is preparation of operative site means you have to clean the area you have to just polish the all the teeth uh, arounding your restorations because if you don't polish it you cannot match the shade accurately the next thing is shade selection we have discussed about shade selection in in our previous lectures so shade of tooth should be selected before drying means uh, before application of rubber dam you have to select the shade because once the rubber dam is there the tooth get dehydrated and the refractive index changed so please guys always uh, measure the shade before dam applications then shade guides are, are available in the market so uh, these shade guides are basically for the crowns uh, but in composite restorations you have to make your own shade guide and we call it custom shade guides and it's a difficult to uh, develop the shade guides but it's possible here every tooth surface is matched for good shade matching and you remember that okay, you, you need an a natural neutral background when to measure the shade and uh, there must be a day time uh, is a good time when you when you have a plan to do a composite restorations and you want to match a shade incisal third is lighter and more translucent obviously in whole surface of the incisor the three different zones the cervical zones the middle zone and the incisal zone and you know in every zone these are different colorations like in cervical there is a more dark dentine then in the middle third incisal third a bit lighter dentine so you need a shade guide where three zones are mentioned where three zones have a different color so like cervical third is darker one i told you already middle third is a blend of the tooth both incisal and cervical third so you have to measure the shade in every zone and might be your shade is different in every zone and shade should be matched within 30 seconds it means that you have to measure the shade as early as possible otherwise your eyes get fatigue and you cannot match, match the shade properly and the important thing is that if you when you measure the shade you have to record it so next appointments if patient is coming to you with some fracture restorations the same restoration that you did 10 years back or 20 months back so if the shade is written you can do that composite restoration again with the same shade so if more time needed look at the blue or violet color means that if your eyes get fatigued and uh, you need a longer time to match the shade better to visualize some blue or violet color so to get your eyes in a relaxed way then you measure the shade again so a small amount of the material can be placed that's not a good option i don't believe in that because i told you enamel is only about 0 0.5 0 0.7 and 0 0.3 mm thick so if you put a lot of composite on the tooth the shade gets gray so better to develop a shade guide according to the thickness of enamel and then measure it uh, in a neutral background you know in a day day time that's the best and suitable time for the shade matching then isolation of the operating site guys we already told you in third year that and uh, rubber dam is an important thing and we have discussed a lot about that so rubber dam is, is is a material of choice when you need an isolation cotton rolls and is not a preferred thing because it gets wet and then you have to change it again and again so once you apply the rubber dam it's there um, until you finish your work and before starting any restorations the important thing is that you have to measure you have to record the pre-op occlusal contacts as when i start my uh, restorations in any patients i First of all, I take the occlusal contacts and take the photograph of it so that when I finish my restorations, I match uh, the contacts uh, previously and the post-op. So it helps me a lot. You don't need to grind the tooth surfaces a lot if you, if you record your occlusal contacts.
then guys after discussing about the composites there are the tooth colored restorative materials available in the markets and that is polyacid modified composite resin and then geomers then we have a glass ionomer cements then we have a resin modified glass ionomer cements then we have the compomers let's discuss something about the compomers uh, i believe that this material is more closer to the composite it's it, it's a mixture of glass ionomers cements and the composite but the properties are more towards the composites the composite to which some glass ionomer components are added you can say in that way so it's primarily light cured and their physical properties are superior to glass ionomers and resin modified glass ionomer but you can say it's bit inferior to composites and what do you mean by when i say that its properties are superior to glass ionomer because glass ionomer cannot bond to the tooth it chemically bond basically and the bond of the glass ionomer with the tooth is a weak bond but the bond of the composite to the tooth is a very strong bond so like that the compomer has more composite properties so the bond of the compomer to the tooth is much better as compared to glass ionomer and the important thing is that they also show some fluoride release guys the composites some composites are available in the market some compomers are available and glass ionomers they are suitable because they su suitable materials because they have the capacity to release the fluoride but they release the fluoride in just 24 hours and then you have to recharge them again so the indications of the compomer is class 2 and class 5 restorations i have mentioned already that class 2 is a proximal surfaces of molars and class 5 on the cervical surfaces of molars so they can be used for restorations in pediatric patients you know in the patients of 5 years and 7 years they're just visiting you and they need some restorations you need a material that can easily bond to the tooth structure because a pediatric patient cannot wait uh, for the long time and uh, have a very uh, so then we have a fissure sealant we can use the compomer as a fissure sealant i told you about composite already that it's a preventive resin so compomer can also be used as a fissure sealant to just block the sealants to block the fissure so that new caries don't develop in all these cases and then for luting of orthodontic bands you know in orthodont uh, departments uh, when we start the ortho procedures we need to uh, bond some bands to the molars so we can apply the wire so in all these cases we can use the compomer just lute uh, the band to the molars uh, compomers should not be used in stress bearing areas yes that's a very common complaint about the comp compomers because they are weak as compared to composites so but they're stronger than glass ionomers but compomers should not be used in the stress bearing areas so now we'll talk about the glass ionomer cements, also called as polyalkanite cements. Uh, it was basically developed by Wilson and Kent in 1972. Material was based on reaction between the silicate glass powder and the polyacrylic acid. And it bonds chemically to the tooth structure and release fluoride for a relatively longer period. Let's come towards the composition. The powder contains calcium aluminum fluorosilicate glass. Breaking it to more precise is silica 29%, alumina 16%, aluminum fluoride 5%, calcium fluoride 34%, and many other traces of the materials. And the liquid is polyacrylic acid by 35%. Tartaric acid will work as an accelerator, and the ratio will be 5 to 15%. Now, coming towards the setting reaction, the setting reaction is in three stages the dissolution gelation and hardening when the powder and the liquid are mixed the surface of glass particle are attacked by an acid then calcium aluminium sodium and fluoride ions are leached into an aqueous medium initially calcium and later aluminium replace the hydrogen ions on the carboxylic group of the polyacid to make calcium aluminium polysalts. The salt <clears throat> hydrate to form a gel matrix while the unreacted portion of the glass particles are surrounded by the silica gel that arises from the loss of surface cations. The set cement consists of unreacted surrounded glass by silica gel bonded together by a matrix of hydrated calcium and aluminium polysalts. 
Notice that fluoride is not <clears throat> an integral part of the matrix formation. Therefore, it is available for release without compromising the structural integrity of the restoration. Coming towards the properties, uh, the film thic thickness is similar or less than zinc phosphate cement. <clears throat> less pulpal irritation is observed. Setting time is 6 to 8 minutes from start of the mixing and it also depends upon the powder liquid ratio. Sometimes we use it as a lining material uh, with 1 ratio 1 and sometimes we use it for the fillings. It is also bacteriocidal or bacteriostatic, prevent caries. It has low solubility. The coefficient of thermal expansion is similar to dentine. High compressive strength. It bonds chemically to the tooth structure. Has low fractural strength. Low shear strength. It is brittle and it also lacks translucency and has a rough surface texture. Strength of GAC the 24 hour compressive strength is greater than zinc phosphate cement. The compressive strength increased to 280 MPa up between 24 hours to 1 year after initial setting. As we talked previously, it bonds chemically to the tooth structure. The mechanism of bonding is same as polyacrylate cement. The dentine bond strength may be lower than polyacrylate because of the technique sensitivity. Now coming towards the modification, the modifications of glass ionomer cements are when the glass ionomer cements are mixed with the silver particles of amalgam, it is known as cermet. It is a combination of a glass and a metal, no significant improvement in the strength, more wear resistance and short shearing time. The next one is resin modified glass ionomer cement. Simply it is a mixture of a glass ionomer and a, a composite in which there is more concentration of glass ionomer cement and the less part, part of the composites. Both chemical and light cure systems are available. Overcome moisture, sensitivity and low early strength. Names light cure GICs, dual cure GICs, tri cure GICs, hybrid ionomers, compomers and resin ionomers. The setting reaction of RMGA is basically a polymerization initial setting then there will be an acid base reaction, maturing processes and the final strength is there. Heat release from the polymerization reaction. Properties are higher strength than the conventional GI, higher adhesion to the resin material, less water solubility, can be polished after curing. Relative properties of glass ionomer cement and a resin modified glass ionomer cement, compare them by the working time setting time, compressive strength and th the tensile strength. There's the major difference lies between the working time and the compressive strength. The compressive strength of the simple GIC is 202 megapascal which was raised to 242 megapascals when RMGI was used. So the classification of resin modified glass ionomer cement is, is of three types, type 1, 2 and 3. In type 1, there is a luting agent. In type 2, there are the filling materials. And in type 3, there are the base and liners. I skipped one thing intentionally. That was the classification of the conventional GIC. Uh, pick up your pencils and write my email ID. It's khal curl 71 at hotmail.com or you can WhatsApp. Me the classification of the conventional GIC. In this very picture, you can see the picture of the conventional GIC and there is a picture of resin modified glass ionomer cements. Thank you.